This program is brought to you by Golden Trumpet. Visit our website at www.goldentrumpet.com and check out our book of Revelation illustrated verse by verse. Listen to our programs where we will study the book of Revelation and other important biblical topics. You can also find our programs in Spanish. One of the greatest needs for humankind is the need to be appreciated, the need to be valued, the need to know someone who understand them, care for them. And one way to define this need, it's the word love. But what is it? How can we define what is love? Here the Webster's Dictionary gives us four definitions and we're going to read it here. So strong affection for another rising out of kinship or personal ties, attraction based on sexual desire, affection and tenderness felt by lovers, affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests, and an assurance of affection. So two common words that we find in these four definitions are affection and attraction, which are mainly good sentiments. So in these definitions, what we see is that love is defined on, based on good sentiments. So love is a good sentiments based process. It's an, it's an internal process. But what, the, what does the Bible say about this word? It's very important. It defines the purpose of the church and the mission of every Christian. Here we're going to use the uh, one of the most popular verses in the Bible, which is John 3.16. Here it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What this verse tells us is that God loved so much that he did something he gave. So love was revealed by giving. God loved the world so much that he gave. So love is given. And we can give so many things. First, we can give time, we can give attention, gifts, support, energy, comfort. But love is defined in the action of giving. The more we give, the more we love. So it is an internal process. It starts in the mind but it is reflected in the action of giving. That is the beginning of the definition of what is love. So in the first definition, the, the, the common definition, it's a love is an internal process. It happens in the mind. Love happens in the mind. But in the Bible, there is an internal process, but love is really revealed in the action of giving. And that would be the beginning of understanding what is the biblical definition of love. So there's two kinds of love that we want to start um, understanding. Here, the biblical love and the common understanding of what love is. But when we read this passage in 1 Corinthians 13, we find that uh, giving is not enough. So we're going to read here 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. This is what it says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. Here, this word charity is the word love. So charity means, um, is the same word used to define God. When it says, when the Bible says, um, God is love, this is the same word. So, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. 
And here in the third verse is going to is going to tell us that giving is not enough, even if I give everything. So, and though, verse 3 says, And though I bestow all, all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profit, for profiteth, profiteth me nothing. So, the key verse here is verse number 3, when it says that even though I give all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it means nothing. And the reason why it says that is because giving, just giving is not enough. There's a piece missing in the definition of love here in the Bible. So it is giving, but it's not just giving. It's one specific kind of giving. So we're going to see what is the kind of giving. For that, we're going to read Luke chapter 6, verse, 30, verse 31 to 34. This is what the Bible says. And as you would want, and as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thing have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive much again. So when Christ was speaking about love in this in this past in this verses in Luke chapter chapter six, he's saying if we love, if we give to those to whom from whom we expect to receive something, there's nothing special in this. Because sinners also do that. So this love can be represented in this interaction. Someone has good sentiments for someone else. And then he, he, he does good actions for that person. And the, it causes good sentiments in the other person. And then the other person does uh, good actions for the other person. And this is what it's understood. This is the common giving. So this is the kind of giving that I give hoping to get something in return. I give because that person is nice to me. And what happens is that when there's good sentiments, I do good things. And there's and I produce good sentiments in the other person. And the other person naturally responds to my good actions. But this kind of giving is not exclusively Christian. Atheist and every religion believes in this giving. All the world is willing to give, hoping for something in return. All the world, if not most of the world, believe that if someone does something good to me, I am compelled to do something good for them. So what Christ is defining in this, in this first verses is that when we give, expecting something to receive from those that do good to us, there's nothing special about it. So love is giving, but it's, it's, it's not just giving to those from whom we expect to receive something. There's something else. So this kind of love is based on good sentiments. So it's good sentiments based giving. This kind of giving is based on good sentiments. It's a love based on good sentiments. So we're going to change the name. And it's really, we're really going to call it sentimentalism. Because it's based in good, good sentiments. Now he continues, explain, he continues explaining here more about the kind of giving that, that he's asking to his people. And here he says, but ye, this is talking about the Christians, but you Christians... But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. But ye, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So the key words here is, love your enemies, do good, 
and land, hoping for nothing again, hoping for nothing in return. So this is the part that was missing in giving. When we give, God is telling us that we are called to give, expecting nothing in return. And that, when we do that, the Bible says here that we shall be called the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So when a believer gives, gives, hoping for nothing in return, he's doing what the father does. So he's, he has the character of the father of God. So this is the best way to define and understand what is the character of God. God gives and he doesn't expect anything in return. So being called in order for us to be called the children of the highest, the Bible says that we are, we are called to give. Jesus says that we have to give expecting for nothing in return. But there's another word that is defined here and it says, be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. So being so loving and being merciful, it's equated here as the same action. When we love, we're being merciful, which means that we are giving to others without, without expecting anything in return. So two key words to understand here is that when we give, Christ says, we are called to hope for nothing in return. And when we do that, we will be called the children of, children of God and we will be merciful, just like the Father is merciful. So the Bible tells us that love is giving, but there's a special giving. It's a giving, hoping for nothing in return. Giving, hoping for nothing in return. So usually when, when, we, when we have good sentiments and we do things for others, hoping for something in return, um, it's easy because um, usually we have good feelings or we have good sentiments for someone else. And then, but what happens is that when the person to whom we're doing good actions have bad sentiments for us and then they respond with bad actions, the natural response, the human response in our mind is to be surprised and to mirror the sentence that they have. That's the natural response. And therefore, uh, we stop, we either stop doing the good actions or we start doing bad actions to that person. But the Bible love, the, the scriptural love, it says that we were called to do things for others, hoping for nothing in return. When we do that, we, we do good actions for others. And even though they respond to us doing something bad, we, we still continue giving because, and if the person continues responding, we're still continue, we can still continue giving. And the reason for this is because we are doing this, hoping for nothing in return. Therefore, if we don't get what we want, it wouldn't matter. We are still doing what the Bible says, which is giving to others. And this is the love that the Bible says that overcomes evil. And this is the kind of love that Jesus had in the cross. When he died, he gave everything, knowing that millions and millions will reject him. But he still did it because that is the character of God. So we need to define this. We need to make a difference between these two words. One is the love from the Bible. And the second one is sentimentalism, which is the common understanding of giving, hoping for something in return. But how is this possible? How is it that I can be giving constantly, even though the person that is in front of me is doing bad actions to me. My human response says that, that I have to defend, I have to respond in the same way that I'm receiving. But how is it possible that 
even though someone is doing something evil to me, which is the definition of an enemy, how can I can still be giving to the other person? How is this possible? Or we mentioned it before, but I'm just gonna re- we're just gonna repeat it here. So when in in a sentimental love, in sentimentalism, what we do is we receive some good from other people, and then it creates good feelings, and we obviously respond with good actions. But when they do something bad to us, our natural response is to do the same. Why? Because it's based on sentiments. Sentiments are change they change constantly and they're very volatile therefore if uh, at one point i have good feelings for someone and i start doing good things for them but the person changes or uh, my feeling change then i can stop I, i can easily stop doing something good for them and to understand it is we need to understand the, the model of a transaction, of an economic transaction. We give something in order to receive something comparable. Is the economic model. So we use that economic model to explain love. So therefore, when we receive, when we do a good action, we expect to receive something good from the other person. And that is the economic model. And then it makes sense that if something does something, someone does something bad to us, we will respond also with something bad to them. Because it's based, this interaction is based on the economic model. But love, I, if I receive good actions from other people, um, I can easily respond as a natural response. I can do good actions for other people. I respond. But even though the person does bad actions to me, I will still be giving and doing good things for them. Why? Because what I do is based on a principle. There are feelings. It's true that there are sentiments. We can never. We're humans. God created us with sentiments and feelings. But even though we have feelings, the feelings are not leading our decision making. Our decision making is based on a principle. So love, the love of the Bible is a principle base, is principle based, while sentimentalism is based on good feelings. So what is the guiding principle of love? What is it that helps us understand that regardless of what the other person uh, does, does to us, we are called to give them? John 14, 15 says, if Christ said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Exodus 24, chapter 20, verses 4 and 6 says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth or that is in the water under the earth. This This is the second commandment. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And she went mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So the principle, the connection here is that love is manifested in the keeping of his Ten Commandments. Here, in the second letter of John, the, the Apostle John defines love and this is what he says john second john chapter 1 verses 4 and 6 i rejoice greatly that i found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the father and now i beseech thee lady know as though i wrote a new commandment unto thee but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another and this is love that we walk after his commandments this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So the key sentence here is, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. So the Ten Commandments are the foundation of love. And we have also this testimony here 
from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 13. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So the scripture principles, not just sentiments, guide the actions of love. Love is guided by the principle of the obedience to the Ten Commandments. Understanding the need to follow the Ten Commandments and obey the Ten Commandments, regardless of, of what the person is doing to us, is the guiding principle of true love. So here we have two kinds of two ways that two ways that love is understood. The first one is the true love that's in the Bible, is the love that hopes for nothing in return, that is principle-based, and the principle of the obedience to the Ten Commandments. And the second one is sentimentalism, which is based on feelings and can change. The question that we have when we talk about love is what kind of love are we talking about when we say this word? Is it biblical love? A love that hopes for nothing in return? Or is it sentimentalism? Now, what kind of love did Jesus teach? We're going to see this, this principle also manifested here right at the introduction of the ministry of Christ in the Sermon of the Mount. Here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I said unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. So from the very introduction of his ministry, Christ made it clear that he didn't come to change the Ten Commandments, but to fulfill them. At the, at the core of his message, after the Bonaventures, he says that he came to fulfill the commandments of God. And at the end of this passage, he says that, he says here that, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the contrast between the idea, the ideas of love that the Pharisees had are opposing the love that Christ came to confirm, which is based in the obedience to the Ten Commandments. We find this also in this experience in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. This is what Christ, this is what Matthew says in chapter 15. Then came Jesus to then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father and mother, It is a gift. By, by whatsoever thou mightest be profit, profited by me, 
and honor not his father and mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandments of God of no effect by your tradition. So the Pharisees came here to admonish Christ that they were not that he was not following the disciples, were not following the tradition of the elders. And he responded to them, Why do you transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? The tradition that is mentioned here is referring to Corban, by which the, the believer, the, the, the Jew at that time, could decide that his property or his business could be Corban, which meant that it was dedicated to the synagogue. Therefore, anything that he profits out of that um, business or house or property was dedicated to the church. So when a father or a mother approached the, the believer saying, my son, my, I, need to, I, need, I need some support from you, which that's what it means when it says honor thy father and mother, he had the right to say, I cannot help you because my house is Corban. So the tradition of Corban was making the commandment of God of no effect was making the fifth commandment of no effect. So the contrast here is again placed between Christ emphasizing the importance of the commandments of God and the Pharisees emphasizing tradition. Here the passage continues. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Here the Apostle John, in the Gospel of John chapter 6, verses 14 to 24, explains this interaction that Christ had with the, with the Pharisees, where he clearly told them that they were not obeying God's commandments. This is what it says. Now about the myths of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And then he says, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? So the, the people the Jews were telling Christ that he was not following the traditions of the elders. And he responded to them that they were not keeping the law. And he emphasized the commandment, thou shalt not kill, which they were planning. The Bible tells us that some of them knew about this plan, some of, of them didn't know, and the, one, the ones that didn't know responded like this. Uh, this is what the Bible says, continue saying, The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave, you, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circum circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the, to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So they were admonishing Christ because he had healed a man on the Sabbath. And by healing the man on the Sabbath, they were accusing Christ of breaking the Sabbath. But he told, told them, none of you obey the law and you're trying to kill me. And then he explains, how is it possible that you can do circumcision to a man 
But if a man is needs healing on the Sabbath, why is it breaking the commandment of, of God? And then he tells them, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. It says here, and then we have here also another interaction between Christ and the leaders of, of, the, of the Jewish nation saying, uh, here in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 30, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, and he, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. So the question is, how can we inherit eternal life? And Christ says, what does the Bible say? The answer is love. And this is why we're studying this topic. It's very important that the answer to inherit eternal life is love. But he didn't understand love very well. He said unto him, Thou answer, thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Christ, And who is my neighbor? So he, and we, let us continue read, reading here. It says, And Jesus answered, answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half death. And then he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. So the question starts, how can I, how, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It says, what does the Bible say? And then he made the correct answer. He replied that the Bible says we should love God with all our heart and our neighbors as, as ourselves. So the answer to inherit eternal life is to have the character of God, the character of love. But what, what he didn't understand was who is that person that he is supposed to give who, that he's supposed to uh, love. Who is that person? They consider that they, the Jews consider that people should love the Jews, but they didn't think that the Samaritans was, were worthy of their love. But then Christ, that he's explaining, he, he made this parable. He, cre he created this parable about the Samaritan man, a Samaritan man that was rejected by the Jews, and how this Samaritan helped the Jew who hated him so much. So he made it clear that we are called just like the Samaritan. Even though the person was a Samaritan, he behaved as a good neighbor by, by helping his Jew, his, his fellow Jew. In the same way, what Christ is stating is that, he's repeating what he did before, is that when we love, we're called love is truly manifested again with those from whom we expect to receive nothing so he made it clear here too so we have in this uh, passages the contrast of true love based on the obedience of the commandments and the pharisees appealing to tradition appealing to the emotions and uh, this is no other than the contrast between true love and sentimentalism. God is now calling us to have a, a better understanding of what it means to love. God is also calling us to understand that when we have those, when we have someone with whom we have difficulties and we are encouraged to give to that person, when we practice giving, to that person that it's our enemy is the person that we have more problems when we have when we're doing that we are really representing christ we're we're doing what god does to humankind because the bible says that when we do that we will be called the children of the highest and we will we will be merciful the question for you and for all of us is what kind of love do you know 
What kind of love are you seeking? Are you seeking sentimentalism? Are you seeking the comfortable love only for those with whom we feel comfortable, only for those with whom we are going to get something? How do we treat those enemies, the difficult people? They may be far, they may be enemies, they may be close to us. The Bible is still in us and, and encouraging us to practice the love of the Bible, to practice the love of God. Christ did it, and we're called to do it too. He showed us the way to understand the meaning of true love. And he's calling us to follow him in doing good to those from whom we expect to receive nothing. This is the first presentation in the series Love and Sentimentalism. Follow our next presentations, The Message of Love Against the Antichrist, The Message of Love and Prophecy, and The Message of Love to Laodicea. You can also find our studies on the Book of Revelation on our website. This presentation can be found on social media using the hashtag GoldenTrumpetStudy1.